Why do you describe it as light, as information that light provides as opposed to energy or this is how they strip off electrons to be able to do all the work that they have to do? Yeah, it's both. It's, it's the driving force of photosynthesis, of course, but light also is packets of information that different parts of the spectrum contain information that drive uh, discrete aspects of plant physiology. And so by understanding how the spectrum con contributes to it, we can understand how different environments like canopy of shade of leaves leaves or a controlled environment um, like we talked about before last time uh, where you're just growing plants in a, a completely artificial environment how those can uh, enhance or detract from plant growth yeah, it's light is such an interesting thing. And actually, I named my daughter based on this ability to have have her name have many different meanings. You know, one Violet, her name's Violet and I, the flower. Right. But then I also really like the idea that ultraviolet is the most excited part of the light spectrum. And when you start falling into the world of how does light work as information, it is an it's like a. Um, a mind riddle or something. The other day, somebody pointed out to me, we don't actually know the speed of light. And the reason that we don't know the speed of light is because light moves faster than everything else. So there's no way to start the timer when it leaves and to hit the timer when it's ended because you can't even tell the timer at the end that you ever started it before the light gets there. Right, you're getting into the relativity problem, and that's the uh, and that's the neat part about it. It's the opposite, the other way, not just in the speed of light, but also the size of a wave band. That microscopy was 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 gated for a long time by the fact that you, you can only re you can only reflect what is the smallest wavelength you can you can only see what reflects the smallest wavelength you have right so you can't uh, you had to start going to electron microscopy and these other types of microscopy because you you can't see something that's not reflecting the wavelength well so that's actually an important thing what do you mean how is it that people actually distinguish light when it hits their eyes it's it's actually because then this is really cool there are discrete molecules in your eyes, in your in your head, that sense and respond to different parts of the spectrum that are spectrally tuned to be sensitive to the red, blue, and green portions of the spectrum. And that's why when you look at, um, when you used to take an old TV screen and wipe it with water, you'd see red, blue, green, and projection TVs are red, blue, and green, that mix. That light is really just these component parts of the rainbow that our bodies, our eyes see discrete portions and then our brains assemble what the image is based upon the relative in color, based on the relative reflection from different parts of that spectrum. At least that's what the cones do. The rods are looking at the um, more of the uh, uh, light on off. So black, white, just kind of depth of, of uh, color are um, contrast on one side, but the other showing colors. And it's just your brain is doing all the dirty work that fluorescent lights are just a lot of green light and some red and some blue and it's perceived by our brain as being white oh that's really interesting is that why you can't just take a fluorescent light and stick it above a plant and be like grow plant grow <laughs> yeah the plant is saying all i see is a whole lot of green and a little bit of blue and a little bit of red and that's some of the impetus that made us rethink the way we grow plants in artificial environments is because the uh, spectrum is so important to plants and dictates that information flow. Um, like I always would say, we speak to plants with the language of light. We're giving them commands. We can give them commands. Photosynthesis that satisfies the energy requirement. Now, now, it's like feeding your dog food. Now, how do you train it to jump through a hoop? You have to give it specific commands. And that's what we can do with light illumination. So here's my uh, dream that I would love to have by the time Violet is one year old. It's a mural in her bedroom that takes um, a, the sun and shows a, a photon flying off of the surface of it. And what it would do, like how it, it fits on the color spectrum in the light spectrum. So I want to have some part of this mural have it be like this is what a, a light wave looks like. Mm -hmm. And then I want it to, underneath that, show the photosynthetic process of a violet growing. So I want to show from the photon flying off the surface of the sun all the way to when it makes this beautiful little purple flower. But I am not creative enough to do that. Where would you start on a project like this? <laughs> well, that's really interesting because you open so many different uh, doors of physics that, you know, light has the products, has the um, properties of a wave, but also as a particle. 
And so that's what's really cool. When what we, does that mean? I hear that all the time. And I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> so you can show that light is a wave because it can interfere with itself. So just like waves on the ocean, you have peaks and troughs. And if you align a peak and a trough, it cancels out. Or if you get two troughs, they amplify or two peaks, they amplify. And what light does that property? You can, you can demonstrate that using some rather interesting, very simple tools. But um, light also has the properties of a particle, which means that um, in the way they know this is something called galvanic response. You hit a piece of gallium and stuff flies off. It acts like a particle. And, a, and what that means to a photobiologist is that, that you can do light biology or chemistry associated with light, like the perception and the rhodopsin in your eyes. Um, th that's the molecule that receives the photon. Y you can get a one-to-one -one response of one photon in, one unit of chemistry out, one chemical change in, in, the, in the eye. And that's what makes it so useful. It's almost like you can think of it as a chemical that you can add one molecule of a chemical to disrupt a receptor or bind to a receptor. We can do the same thing with photons. Whoa. So how in the world did a plant biologist like you move into the world of light? Did you come at it from a <laughs> physics perspective or you had to learn this? Like why, why do you know as much about light as you do? Well, it's kind of backwards. I, I was, a, I'm a molecular biologist by training mostly that, and that had a broad, uh, broad exposure to everything from yeast to prokaryotic biology to cancer biology. I mean, we covered everything. And I happened to work in a plant laboratory where I, and that's kind of because my undergraduate work was in a plant laboratory. Uh, but the, all of the light stuff comes about because we were understanding the fundamental mechanisms by which plants interpret their environment. And I was very fortunate to have been in school from, you know, I started college in 86 or 85. And that's just when all of this was starting to explode. How do, it was starting to figure out how does a photon of light connect to changes in gene expression? And what is the molecular transduction of the binding to a receptor, altering a receptor, telling another molecule something, telling another molecule something, ultimately changing genes that are turned on. Um, that was stuff that I've seen from all the way through. And so that's why light is so important. So going back to this mural idea, when you think about this process that's going on in your head, do you have an actual working model in your mind, something that you could draw or something that you could create? I'm not asking you to create the mural. I'm saying, does it <laughs> exist that a model for how to show that this is going to represent how this is going? Yeah, I think so. I think you could do it with plants. But what's interesting is, unfortunately, violet or ultraviolet, the, the wavelengths uh, lower than 400 nanometers, we can't perceive with our sensory apparatus. Plants can certainly see that. They have a molecule that's tuned, at least one molecule, that's tuned specifically to that part of the spectrum. And so, uh, you know, you could show that, you know, how does this thing, when a photon of the right wavelength comes in, it causes this molecule to shift its conformation and dimerize with another and go do something. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.